That's it. Yeah, let's get started. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today and uh, sticking it out. We know this is the kind of the last talk of the day. Um, really appreciate you guys giving us your attention here. And uh, welcome to hardware testing at Hyperscale. I am uh, joined by my esteemed colleagues today. Uh, my name is Paul. I work for Meta as a QA lead. We have Vinton, Vincent Matosian here, who is the software engineering manager at Meta. We have Dan Frame here, who is a software engineering at Google. And um, we're here to present hardware testing at Hyperscale for you guys. So what do we really want to start with is um, the early days of DC hardware testing. I probably shouldn't say that because um, my first processor really was a Intel Pentium 120 megahertz processor. Some people here probably have a little more mileage than I do. <laughs> but yeah, um, back in the day in data centers, um, Server counts were really not that high. We really only had uh, single unit processor kind of things that we were dealing with. Units were very homogenous across the board. They were very similar. You were building units that were basically built to be tested and uh, utilized in a very specific way. So people were building units in-house. Um, and most of the testing and validation was done really in uh, one integration facility. You didn't really have too many deltas here to think about. But those were really the good old days. Things have changed from then. So what happened then? We entered the hyperscale era. Machine growth has been phenomenal over the past couple of years. Um, we now talk about things in, in scales that are unimaginable well, when 10 years ago. you know. Uh, different machine types. We have so many different types. We have accelerator cards. We have storage units. We have so many different types of varieties of processors and things like that. It's no longer just CPU-centric things, right? It is actually a very different world that we deal with today. Tests and diagnostics are no longer 100% developed internally. We actually build them with ODMs. We actually work with a lot of different partners to test our equipment. So. The processes that we have today are proprietary, but they have documented interfaces. The NPI cycle has shortened dramatically since the history of this, and it really has actually um, eliminated the duplicate work for test and validation to be competitive. So a lot of the things that we are doing today, a lot of our friends in the OCB community are doing the same thing to validate their equipment as well. So the question here is, why do something unique? Now, to talk about the different stages of testing, we, we do recognize that there are multiple stages in testing that we have. There are stages that are low volume and really early in the life cycle where things are a little slower, you're running your equipment, there's a different level of stress testing that you want to apply to your equipment, you want to actually make sure and validate that equipment in a very different way. So these are very early stages, like in hardware bring up, where you're looking at power sequencing, you're looking at how the equipment starts, you're looking at different stages of um, EVT, DVT, PVT bring up. So those are completely different test cycles from where you will be later on in your testing. So you have the hardware bring up stage, you have the system integration testing stage, you do have the reliability testing stage as well, where you're looking at different metrics. And then we have the volume application stages where we're looking at testing different servers and equipment at volume where the tests are, again, completely different. We have tests that execute over long hours. We have tests that hammer the equipment consistently. We want to check for different type of parameters in the equipment, different CPU kind of requirements and things like that. And also the audiences for these things are completely different. Instead of looking at hardware engineers, now manufacturing engineers are looking at the equipment. They're wondering, how do I make this scale as a process rather than, oh, can I actually bring up the hardware correctly and is the hardware working correctly? The stakeholders have changed, right? We are now looking at the contract manufacturers who are also looking at the process to see if this is a sustainable process for them. We're looking at data centers who actually implement this hardware and are actually going to use this hardware in day-to-day -day basis. We're looking at RMA people who are wondering, oh, how reproducible is this failure that I have in my data center, and can the manufacturer actually reproduce the same failure? So the stakeholders consistently change throughout your life cycle of your hardware, and things are evolving consistently throughout the entire life cycle. 
So in this slide, we really want to ex uh, ex sorry, pardon me. We really want to showcase that. There are really multiple use cases, different scenarios. And each, in each of these scenarios, there are many different test executives. There are different sequences. Even within companies, there are different executives. There are different test runners. There are different things that we do use to run these tests and to get the data, to harvest it, to make decisions based on that data. So the test cases are completely different. There can be long-running tests, there can be short-running tests, and we are looking at different types of components, right? We're looking at whether it's a chip, it's a hard drive, it's a CPU. What kind of root cause scenarios can we find out of it? Who are the people looking at this, right? They're also completely different. So throughout the product lifecycle, and as we extend towards the end, we do recognize the fact that testing does get longer, it does get harder, and the, completely, the data set that we're looking at is completely different. So what are we trying to solve? What are the challenges that we really want to solve here? Like, if we think about it, there is a very common set of tests that we use for testing in hardware. Some of these tests are, are built in a way that they should be portable, but they're not today, because everyone runs these different executives. I know for a fact, because I've built probably 10 test executives in my lifetime for different purposes and for different companies. So these tests are definitely not portable. I, I can't even count the number of times I've rewritten iPerf <laughs> or wrap around iPerf to make it work in a different executive environment. So what are we trying to solve here? We're trying to solve how do we make this diagnostic portable and acceptable across different environments? How do we make the test results reliable, reproducible? And how do we actually make them accessible to different vendors and stakeholders that are part of this entire process? Again, as, and, and through the entire process, as the DUT count increases, so does the pressure for test time and fault, uh, fault isolation to aid the repair cycles. We really have to recognize that we are testing different equipment at different stages in the product life cycle. At the beginning, we are looking at chip level testing. We evolve to uh, maybe power bring up at EVT. We look at different things at DVT, and by the time we get to the DC level, we're looking at fullable components, and that's a completely different ballgame from what we're looking at at the initial chip stage. And with that, I will pass on the baton to my colleague, Dan. Thank you, Paul. So yeah, I want to talk a little bit about how we got here. So previously, we had a solution to run diagnostics in our data center that actually worked quite well for us. The problem was when we tried to run it at other places. And this is a scenario short of real world for Google, where we had a test executive, we had a diagnostic as a service daemon. Behind that, there were lots of RPC calls and messages and job handlers and tasks. But the only thing anybody really wanted out of this was the test. They didn't want the infrastructure. So what we tried to do was say, what can we do to divorce the test from our infrastructure and reuse it everywhere? So what could we do? So typically, we have a diag that targets the device. And then we're looking at many different consumers of that diag, all the way from the validation labs, the design partners, manufacturing tests, data center operations, all the way to reverse logistics. We want the same test coverage everywhere. When we see a problem, we want to be able to reproduce it everywhere. So that's what we're trying to do with this framework, which we're calling the OCP Diagnostic and Validation Framework. What this basically does is it provides multiple language support. We know different people use different development tools. We have a proven data model for diagnostic output. We have APIs that make it very easy to produce that output. For very long-running tests that are used during validation, some of these tests may run for weeks. We have a streaming format. We know that when you use these tests in different places, we need to override parameters and configure the tests differently. To facilitate that, we have a simple yet powerful parameter management library. And then we have two other libraries that we include as well. One is a device communication library that allows your control computer to talk to your device under test. And then we also have an optional hardware abstraction layer that I'll talk a little bit about. So how does this fit into test environments, right? As Paul mentioned, there's a million different test executives, and we're not looking to replace your test executive. Test executives have a ton of touch points outside the data center. They tie into ERP, they tie into the MES system, they tie into the Diag itself. Whereas the Diag really only has two touch points. 
It has the parameters going into it and then the data coming out. Now there's other touch points with the Diag, right? But that's the cost of playing the game. You need to touch the drivers, you need to touch the OS, and you ultimately need to touch the hardware's firmware, sometimes down to the register level. That's part of the Diag. It's not part of the test executive. So our result model, what does it look like? It's very simple. We have a test run. The test run encompasses everything to do about the test that we perform. We break that test run down into the individual test steps, and those test steps have diagnoses. It's the evaluation that we've derived, is the hardware good or bad? To derive that evaluation, we've looked at all this data. We have the measurement. We have a measurement series, which is time series data. We have logs. We have limits. We have thresholds. We have information about the hardware. All of this goes into providing that diagnosis. So let's look at a real world example. This is a memory latency test, right? What we're doing here is we're testing the memory latency from one CPU with the nodes inside that CPU to a two socket server as well. So there's basically one test here that we're calling a memory latency test that has two steps for intra and inter node bandwidth, right? Um, you can see the diagnoses that we've made here in green where we said that both nodes are good. We've tied those diagnoses to the particular hardware that we've evaluated, in this case, the two CPUs. And then we also have all the measurement data that supports those diagnoses. All of that comes out in a simple format that we believe can be used anywhere. So to generate that, we have APIs that can generate the test runs. We have APIs that can generate the test steps. And we have APIs that can generate all that supporting data. Now, there's several of these. This here, for instance, is the measurement series. But if you look, they're all very simple. They're add, output, you know, create the object. It's very, very easy to use. For our output, we use different outputs in different runtime environments. By default, we use JSON. Why do we use JSON, right? It's highly portable. It's self-describing. There's no metadata needed. It's human readable and machine readable. A human can look at the output and a machine can parse the output. There's many visualization and validation tools available. It's widely known. Everyone has expertise with this format. And JSON-L, which is line delimited JSON, provides us a way to stream out extremely large amounts of output. Now, JSON's not perfect. There's limitations. It's not performant, right? There's a high level of transmission redundancy when you send the keys and the same values over and over. And it's also computationally expensive to parse. It's slow. But we've selected those compromises because we value the efficiency of simplified integration over the efficiency of the protocol format. Now, internally, all this data is strongly represented by protocol buffers, right? It's not freeform data. So that's there. But when we talk to the outside world, we want an open format. This is what that format looks like. I've kind of color coded this. It's an eye chart, but you can see the test run, the test steps, the supporting data, all the things that we saw in that previous diagram, and this is what it looks like. So we also have a parameter model. As requirements are assigned to diags at different places where they are used, we need to override them, right? We need to customize the diag for what we're trying to do for where it's at in its environment and also where the product is in its life cycle. As the product matures, we add more and more tests and test time becomes more and more critical, right? As we're building 10 or 100,000 of these, this is where we want to adjust the failures so that we find them earlier and we want to optimize test time. We do all that via this parameter model. This is an example of what our parameters look like. We have a very simple file that defines the messages, we define the data types of the parameters, and then a simple little help string that we use to generate output like you see on the left. So here you can see we're passing the help flag to our diag. It's giving you all the parameters as well as their default values and what type of parameter it is, and also a description of how it's used. So in other words, if you have a diag that may contain hundreds of parameters, you don't have to set all the hundreds of parameters. You only need to set the parameters that you want to override. Now, I talked a little bit earlier about how we have multiple languages that we support, right? One of the other things is we want portability. If we're using a compiled language like C++ or Go, it's very different than if we're using an interpreted language like Python. In all cases, we want to build a single simple to distribute binary. We do all that with the Basel build system. 
This is an open source version of the tools that Google uses internally. It's widely used on Android and getting more and more adoption in the open source community. Here's what our parameter overrides look like at different levels of where you can go in and override the profile. By default, we'll have a default JSON file. You can override that with your own JSON file, and you can override that again with different command line flags. Now, as you have all these different levels of being override the parameters, it can get confusing. To help, we provide a dry run flag. This does not run the diag. All it's going to show you is what parameters were used in its execution. We also have a communication interface. We mentioned between the difference of running a diag in the lab, where it may be run by a human by hand as we're doing hardware bring up, Sometimes when we're running a Diag, that's all we need. Other times when we get into a manufacturing scenario, we need to automate that Diag, and we need to communicate in a way that we can script. Typically in manufacturing, that's SSH. When we get to the data center, we want to run the same Diag, and SSH is not allowed. We need a fully auditable and traceable protocol. In this case, we can plug in a different proprietary communication interface without rebuilding the Diag. It looks like this. We have a diagnostic. The diagnostic targets the communication interface. And there's different back-end implementations. Out of the box, we provide the open SSH implementation. And then we also have proprietary DC implementations that Meta, Google, and others can use. This is what that API looks like. It's really simple. There's a way to execute a command, and there's a way to read and write files. This is all you need to implement with your back-end communication profile. It's not a lot of effort. We also have a hardware interface. The hardware interface provides our abstraction to the hardware. So why do we need this? As we run the Diag at different stages, we may go from proprietary ways to get the information to more open ways. We're trying to move to more open OCP hardware. So this is an example of a Diag targeting a hardware abstraction layer. And we can see where we're using a config file to target different backends. Here we may have a host-based backend. We may have an open Redfish backend that's executing on a BMC, or we could have a custom backend that's using an RPC server that's running on the server. Here's a real-world example of a CPU test that needs to get some information about the CPU. We target the hardware interface to ask for information about the CPU. How that hardware interface actually gets it is implementation dependent. We may use something as simple as LSCPU, we may cat proc CPU info. We may use DMI decode. We may use Redfish. Or we could use a tool internal that we call Jesus. It doesn't matter, and the Diag doesn't know where the data is coming from. You can reconfigure it with the file. You don't need to rebuild it. All the things that I presented today, we provide that with multiple language support. Today, we use Python. We have C++. And Golang support is coming very soon. So at this point, let me turn it over to Vincent to bring us home. All right. Thanks, Dan. So a quick look back at everything that we are providing today to the community. We have the hardware abstraction layer. We have the parameter model syntax. We have a data model and an API and a connection interface. And to that, we're bringing a repository in which we're making a language agnostic JSON schema format for the test IO output. Uh, that anybody can write a test to that will be ingested and runnable by any test executive. We are also making available diagnostics that are going to be uh, available that run on any test executive and can test any component um, uh, in a portable manner. These are not just proof of concepts. We've actually ported those in both open source, uh, including OpenTAP, open test and contest uh, test executive frameworks, as well as closed source uh, test executives, uh, both from Google and Meta's Fava um, hardware test framework. And there's many more coming soon. So for those of you who have missed the Experience Center, it's a little too late now to actually stop by, but we have a few screenshots here. We can see one diagnostics, in this case for the PCI, test uh, run in contest in a CLI. We have the exact same diagnostic here run in Meta's Fava framework and run here in Google's OpenTest framework and in Keysight's OpenTap, although it's open source. 
the takeaway from these four um, sort of um, test executives that we've shown is that they are they are running in distinct operating systems and environments, but they're running the exact and reporting on the exact same um, diagnostic. Um, and by doing so, we're able to, to show that we can take one diagnostic and run it in any environment where a hardware test is, is needed. That includes labs, manufacturing sites, and data centers. So the key is where do you get all this and how do you get involved? So you should head to Open Compute's GitHub uh, repo at ocp-diag-core. And this is where you'll find all the runtime and libraries that are needed to run diagnostics. So over the next few months, we're going to be making available more and more uh, non-server differentiated uh, diagnostics so that uh, you can test the components, be it for memory, CPUs, storage, communication buses, machine check error monitoring, network interfaces, environmental monitors, and power performance or benchmark monitors. Um, the call to action we have to the community is that if you're interested in having portable tests, either as a user or a contributor, um, you should get involved, reach out, go and head to the project wiki page that's at the bottom here, uh, and get involved. We're really looking forward to the input as we're shaping this initiative. Again, anywhere where hardware is, tests are needed, uh, we believe this uh, common framework is going to bring uh, a unifying central force for OCP hardware going forward. So this work wouldn't have been possible without the help of uh, so many people called out here. Uh, across OCP, uh, Google, Meta, HP, Keysight, and Nine Elements. So a big thanks to all of them here. And on this note, thank you. We're open and available for questions. We have a few minutes here ahead. 